Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to day two of theCUBE's live coverage of Falcon 2024 here at the ARIA. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host, co-analyst, Dave Vellante. It is still buzzing in here. It's really incredible yeah, to think that this, this is afternoon. after lunch, and yeah, this is pretty incredible. Have you been over the other side yet? No, not no, yet. Check it out. Okay. That's where we were last year. We were stationed on the other side. It's I've been here, here at this hub. We are fire marshal full. We are, we are indeed. And I want to introduce our next guest. He is Spencer Thompson, CEO and co-founder of Prelude. Thank you so much Thank for coming for on the queue. I appreciate it. So tell our viewers, Prelude, it's four years ago you founded this company. Roughly. Uh, roughly. Yes. Tell yeah. our viewers a little bit about, about what you do. Very simple. So most often a board, when a famous or newsworthy article comes out about a public cyber attack, the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg will write an article about how scary it is. A very well-meaning board will take that article, they send it to the CEO, and they write, what the heck, the CEO. That CEO very often passes it to a wonderful CISO who says, what the heck, who then asks their teams. They're all asking effectively the exact same question. Are we protected against that attack happening from us? It's all we do is answer that question. We do it in two ways. One is we validate your controls are working, making sure if you pay for wonderful tools like CrowdStrike, you're getting the most out of it. And the second is we run advanced simulations of that attack against your infrastructure. So we literally mimic the behaviors, the signatures of that attack. We can tell you with like 100% certainty if you're actually going to be protected against an attack or not. So you're like a friendly hacker. That's that a very friendly choice. hacker. Yeah. Super friendly. So, so back, back a step. Why yeah. did you start the company? And how did you start the company? Very kind of meandering, strange story. I'm sure you look at my background a little bit, but I started an ed tech company a long time ago. Well first, you dropped out of college. First I dropped out of college, <laughs> which is a whole other story too, which I'm happy to talk about. Started an ed tech company. I actually started a school. It's funny, I just gave a talk in, in, in one of the other rooms, and one of the people in the audience was one of my students at the school. Wow. That was called the Prelude Institute. That school literally helped people become tier one SOC analysts from scratch. They had to have no background in IT, no background in cyber. And so that was the first incarnation of, of Prelude. COVID killed that business. We literally had in-person classrooms in New Hampshire and Seattle, killed the business, completely pivoted towards offensive cybersecurity. So that was why it's roughly 2022 that we started this business. But it's been a very kind of organic process. You couldn't have run that business remotely? It's just you had to be kind of... We believe very deeply in being in person to help yeah. people. Belly to belly. Yeah, we made the decision to not do that anymore and instead pivot you know, incredibly hard into offensive security, raise a lot of money, and here we are. So, do you do pen tests? Uh, is that part of it? Do you partner yeah. for that? Uh, do you have tooling to do that? If you think about a pen test, it's typically outside in. You're looking at a web application, you're looking at a very important thing, you're running a, a single kind of attack against that. Right. We literally say, if you take Fuzzy Bear or any of the things that CrowdStrike's talking about, how do you actually know when that threat intelligence comes out, whether you can actually stop that or not? It turns out that threat intelligence is usually 20, 25 steps. It's highly complex. It takes a long time to build tests against that. We will literally go and build those tests in minutes. And right, we can talk about that in a second around AI. Yeah, right. But like, we actually go and remember every part of the attack chain to run it against your infrastructure. So it's very, I would say it's much more robust and complete than a typical pen test. Uh, but also much more complicated. How did you build your team? Because yes. as Dave said, you're yeah. a very friendly hacker, but you need to hire people who, who have that kind of mindset, who can yeah. think like an infiltrator, think like an adversary. Yeah. So, so how did you find the people, and what skill sets were you looking for? We have a really interesting group of people on the team, so I'll give you one example. Um, we have a guy named Matt Hand who works for the company. He wrote a pretty well-known book called Evading EDR. And that book literally dissects how EDR, EDR actually works. Uh, it's not really about evading it, it's how to actually kind of deconstruct some work. He is a red teamer at a bunch of very kind of famous companies. Why does he work here? Because he understands what it takes to actually protect organizations against these kinds of kind of common malware and behavior. Okay, that's one example. We have executives from Wiz, we have executives from Tanium, we have executives from a bunch of different organizations that all come together. It's actually not just a hacker mindset. Hacker mindset's kind of on the research side. We have a lot of the commercial mindset side that all kind of fuse together, some former CrowdStrike employees as well. So it's kind of a mix of everything. How did you fund the company? Tell us that story. Fund the company? Fund it, yeah. So when we did the pivot uh, back in 2022, we, event, we decided to focus kind of very squarely on an open source project. Uh, that caught the attention of some early kind of pre-stage investors, and then our Series A was largely Sequoia Insight. CrowdStrike's an investor in the business, business through the Falcon Fund. Mitre's an investor out of the kind of corporate parent. So kind of we brought a whole bunch of people together for the, for the and, round. And when did you do that raise? Uh, April 2022. Okay, so that was... It was not the greatest time to do a raise, right? Because the market it was, was in changing. between time. It so was what was that? Right, you were in the. It was like ZERP-ish, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it was so sort of yeah. yeah. Okay, but but it was post Ukraine. It was. 
And so sentiment had started to turn. Yep. Uh, was it a difficult time to raise, or did, you, did your background enable you to? I think we got very lucky, to be honest. Mm -hmm. We got, um, we can take some credit towards having a, an ambitious vision, but I think we caught the tail end of a, a kind of macro, had, uh, macro tailwinds into cyber being a, a, an investable category. I think Zerp still had some kind of remnant effects. But we, are, we have some of the world's best investors in the company. And so I think they're also very discerning about what is good and what is bad. And so one of my kind of adages is like, great quality companies endure through whatever market, doesn't really matter. If you provide value to customers, they vote. And it's an as-a-service model? It an is. A, an, an, an ARR? Correct. Uh, approach? Yep. Okay. And, yep. and do you have product market fit at this point? That's a great question. The reason I shrug my shoulders is because we live in a world that changes so frequently. Like, mm -hmm. I could have given you that, that answer definitively six months ago and been like, absolutely we do. If we do not keep up, we will not have it in six, four months. So I would say we are on our way right now. Uh, we have a bunch of really kind of talented and I would say very deep customers that we work with. Uh, we spend a lot of time with the CrowdStrike folks on partnering through both the marketplace but also with a bunch of their customers. Um, so yeah. So you've really only been through like one, maybe two renewal cycles? I was going to say, right? we're actually approaching our first renewal cycle right now. Oh, okay. We only so went in GA last June, July. Okay, last so year. Uh, what are the signals that you as a CEO look at yeah. to, to, to determine? I mean, I think product market fit is all about adoption. And if you can get people to renew, yeah. that's the best sign. You yeah. know, Andreessen says, oh, when your servers are blowing up, okay, I guess. Yeah. But uh, uh, what, what are the signals that you look at, yeah. Spencer, to, to gauge whether people will renew? For me, it's actually a little bit, I agree with that point totally. It's a little bit different. It is the human element. There's usually a person that relies on that product to do their job. If they cannot do their job without your product, you have product market fit. Like there is this almost like weird mm. energy that you feel when somebody actually uses the product, when they actually adopt the product, when they tell other people about it. There's a lot of in-between versions of that. Building world-class products is actually super, super hard. But if you go to the practitioner on the floor right now and you ask about CrowdStrike, they love CrowdStrike, right? It's the practitioner. Yes, the CISOs love it. They watch Formula One, they see Mercedes, whatever else. <laughs> but the practitioners have to be obsessed with it too. And well, they've consistently mm. said best product. I mean, They yeah, have, and I think that that is such an excellent point is that yeah. you need the, the people, the front line people who yeah. are doing the job to evangelize and then tell their boss, hey, yeah, I need this. Yes, I think, I think typically a lot of cybersecurity was bought by CISOs top down and they said, hey, use our stuff. Right. And they would say, well, that's not my favorite product. And so, bottom up I think is also important. So if, if, it's, if your product market fit is, I mean it is for any company, but it sounds especially for you, yeah. it's ever changing because of the nature of cyber. Yeah. How as a CEO do you decide when to scale go to market? It's a great question. So I'm a big believer in this concept of the inevitable arrow of progress, which sounds like a weird, stupid thing to say. Explain. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, part of my job is synthesis of macro, just like an investor. Ultimately, CEOs are capital allocators. My job is to invest dollars into things that return something at some point. People usually don't think about it in that way, but it's the same job. Yeah. So the inevitable arrow of progress is if you look two, three, four years out, what is inevitable in the world? What is going to happen? Jeff Bezos has a very famous quote around this, which is he says, in the future, will customers want books to be more expensive or less expensive? <laughs> will, he want them, will they want those books faster or slower? Will they want them faster and they want them cheaper? So we invest every dollar into those things. That's it. So for us, we go, is AI going to affect cyber, for example, and make attacks more rapid or less rapid? Well, more rapid. Do people want more autonomy and more kind of like autonomous work or they want more manual work, autonomous work, great. Let's invest very deeply in those things that don't change, the fundamentals that don't change in a couple of years. Yeah, oh, great, thank yeah. you for that. That's a great answer. As an entrepreneur, and Prelude, as you said, this is not your first rod rodeo as, yes. a, as a founder. Uh, I'm curious where you fall on the debate of higher education right now, because there really are real questions that people are grappling with, particularly yeah. as the cost of college has skyrocketed yeah. for so many people, and, and wondering whether or not the degree is actually worth it. Yeah. You're someone who's, who's ha already had some success without a college degree, yeah. but not everyone, not everyone can be like you either. So yeah. where do you fall? What are your thoughts on this? I think it's incredibly complicated. It's such a bad way to start an answer, but I think that's like the only answer. So I spent nine years building a company in education technology, so I've had like various views of this. I think really world-class programs endure. Some of them are cheap, by the way. Some of them are very expensive. They endure the test of time. I think the vast preponderance of uh, higher education costs a lot of money, and it's maybe not the best fit for a lot of people. So, okay, fair enough, yeah. fair enough. Yeah, I mean the ROI, as, as one with four children, <laughs> you have <laughs> to question the ROI. With and I, yes. I have kids yes. who went to private schools and public schools, state schools, 
And I, I would say that the delta and the spectrum between you yeah. know, a small liberal arts school in upstate New York, uh, a, a school like Ole Miss in the deep south, yeah. and everything in between is, is pretty narrow band. Yeah. And yeah. I think a lot of it is the experience and, and, and the fit and the culture, but just you know, at the end of the day, if, you, if you've got the, the brains and the you know what, go for it. <laughs> I think it's actually, I think an interesting point on that is like culture endures through any product. Like yeah. higher education's a product, buying cybersecurity is a product. There are world-class organizations where you feel it in every single thing that they do. Right. You feel it in the leadership, you feel it in the website, you feel it in the brand. So like Babson College, for example, they do an incredible job. Are they in the top 10 list of any elite whatever? Usually not. They, they are, did you know the Wall Street Journal? Yeah. Yeah. I saw the NBA yeah. program, yeah. Right. John Furrier is a, a Babson alum. Oh, is he? Those okay. are great, like Northeastern, yeah. Babson. Yeah. Just yeah. Like picking on these no, they're coming, they're coming, they're up and coming. But that's because they have incredible leadership. Yes. Like, you cannot replace incredible leadership. So, my whole thing is, I don't care if it's a school, I don't care if it's a cyber company, you pick things that have definitive cultures. They're the best in the world, they obsess over excellence, they obsess over customers. And that's it. So as a young leader, yeah. how, where do you go to for advice and for yeah. mentorship and for ideas? Because you are, you are doing the work of your company, but you're also leading a team. Yes, I think I am incredibly fortunate to be, I mean, one of our investors is Sequoia Capital. So I am the least successful person by far of any of the founders at Sequoia Keeps Capital. Keeps you humble. Keeps you humble, oh, Spencer. I think, I think humility, by the way, builds curiosity. Like, the actual answer to your question is you have to believe in your gut that you have things to learn. Not everybody actually believes that. There's a lot of people that go, oh, I'm actually, I went to school and I've sold a company and so therefore like, I'm good to go. That's not true. And so I am surrounded by literally world-class entrepreneurs all the time. So I, I'm very fortunate, I have a bunch of friends that have sold companies that are very successful. I call and lean on them all the time. My family is a huge part of that too. But I, for me, I try and surround myself with excellence to remind myself uh, there's a long way to go, which there is. Excellent, indeed, indeed. So talk about what the kinds of conversations that you're having here yeah. at, at Falcon and, and, and the customers you're interacting with yeah. and ideas that you're going to take with you back to Vancouver. One very enduring theme for us is actually act, uh, making threat intelligence actionable. If you go all the way back to the beginning of CrowdStrike, like the first two and a half years, they actually did, were not selling next-gen AV or EDR at the time, it was literally just threat intelligence. These very long, complex, amazing documents that are 30, 40 pages come out, and they say, ah, this spooky thing is happening. You should really like, pay attention to that inside of your company. And we, what we've gotten a lot of at this conference is, how do we do that? Like, so we spent a lot of our time applying AI to that. I'm sure you haven't heard of AI at all <laughs> in this conference. Uh, but we spent a lot of time you know, basically automating almost all of that work. And so for us, people come to us and they say, can we please make that process that takes a month or a week, take five minutes, how do we do that? It's been a big theme for us. Um, actually, just reducing friction in general. I think people are sick and tired of the 100 tools that they have to tune and tweak and maintain and this and that, and they just want us to reduce friction over and over again. Do you see that, that tools creep changing? Because the data suggests that it's, that the consolidators are kind of losing the I read that entropy's I, winning. I, I read that too, which is like, when you take the survey of most ESOs and say you're going to buy more tools, they actually say more tools still. Um, and we're at like 90-ish tools per, per place. I, I don't know is the short answer. Yeah. What I do know is that, again, going back to the teams, they get very frustrated that they have, imagine the number of POCs you have to run to buy 90 tools. 400, yeah. 350 POCs, they're spending a lot, at we least. hear a lot of is, right. we spend a lot of our time evaluating tools and not actually implementing tools. Mm. Which is why I started when, the first part of, uh, of the talk on what do we do. The whole first half is basically autonomous config management. How do you actually make sure, CrowdStrike has 51 different policies, roughly, inside of their tool. I don't know what most organizations, if you have 100,000 endpoints, are you sure that they're working properly on all those endpoints? It's very, actually, it's a really hard question to actually answer. We spend a lot of time on figuring that part out for customers, right. that takes five minutes. And then once that's ready, then they say, let's actually go and run you know, simulations against that stuff. My last so, question, yes. what do you, fast forward to, what is it, September? <laughs> September 2025? Yeah. What do you want to be able to say, Spencer, 12 months from now that you can't say today? I would love to be able to say that we can take any threat that has happened in the past or potentially will happen in the future and automate every single step of telling you if you're protected against that in under a minute. Oh, nice. Under a minute? Under a minute. Whoa. That is our goal. That's ambitious. 
I love it. I agree. I love it. Bold, yeah, audacious goals. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks, exactly. Good luck. <laughs> oh, I'm, yeah. I'm pulling for you. Yeah, thank you. no, uh -huh. very cool. Spencer yeah. Thompson, thank you so much thank for coming so on theCUBE. A pleasure having it. you on. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of our live coverage of Falcon 2024. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.